Good morning. morning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 as we walk verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. You know, just because it seems far off doesn't mean it's irrelevant. Let's be honest about the distance between us and this text that we're looking at today in Mark chapter 6. So for you, it gives very specific instructions from Jesus to his disciples. For you to follow them, you would need to go procure a tunic. They'd probably sell them on Amazon if you're already, already Googling it where you're at. But you'd probably need to procure a tunic, not two tunics, one tunic. Get your sandals and your tunic and your staff. Quit your job and go live on the couches of strangers. That is how one would... Oh, by the way, when you're there, you're preaching the gospel and casting out demons. So uh, we're going to have a sign up in the back. <laughs> For all that, uh, you can email me, Pastor, if you're watching online, Pastor at DryerBaptist.org. Sign up for that stuff, uh, and we'll uh, get you started on that. Now, to, to be honest, that's a little foreign to our culture, unless you're already wearing your tunic to church. But it's also foreign to the call of the disciples on a different day. So here's what I mean by this. this. This first time that they're being sent out in Mark chapter 6, they're given these specific instructions. The next time they're sent out and other times subsequent to this, he tells them to take a sword and other items along with them. So the prescription that we're looking at here today is, is not only different for us, but they didn't even follow it on a different day. So what do we do with this text that we're looking at today? As how they're sent off in this way. Is the answer that we all read this text and we go be homeless for several months without jobs, preaching the gospel and casting out demons. Possibly. But probably not. You see, they're, they're sent out at other times and in other ways, but they had to be sent out in this way first. Because what we see today in Mark chapter 6 are very basic principles for discipleship that we have to start with in following Jesus. These men had to start here before they could actually take things with them. They had to learn these things. They could not get around these lessons and principles that we see in Mark chapter 6. They could not get around it. They could not get past it. We cannot get around these principles. We cannot get past these principles. So let's look at these very basic principles of how Jesus wants us to live every day as his followers. If you wouldn't mind to stand in the honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. Let's look at this together. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it for Jesus' name had become known. And we'll stop right there. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would make your son known through the preaching of this text. 
that you would show us something of the glory of, the God, of God in the face of Christ through the preaching of his word in his church on his day. Do this among us. We're powerless without you to see it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, a big transition takes place. I don't know if you noticed it here in Mark, but in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus goes out through villages preaching. Up until this point, it was a one-man operation. One teacher, one minister, there's one ministry of Jesus These other guys following him around and learning from him. Well, the transition happens between verse 6 and verse 7, because in verse 7, this happens. Jesus sends out these men. The very point of the text is that Jesus replicates himself in calling his disciples. And as we walk through these verses together, we need to look at how he does that. These are the principles we can't get around, is how he sends out his disciples, how he calls them. Because there's a big transition that happens between verse 6 and verse 7, and elsewhere, there's another transition in Mark chapter 6 that's different. They were disciples at the beginning of the chapter. They were learners. Learning things. In chapter 6, there's a transition. They're not learners really as much anymore as they are apostles. So we see the transition between discipleship and apostleship. So learning and going. So as we look at that very basic principle in verses 6 and 7, we learn that Jesus, he called them to be sent called them to be sent. And he called the twelve in verse 7 and began to send them out two by two and give them authority over unclean, over the unclean spirits. So very important. What happens here is Jesus calls them to himself and then sends them out. Very important order. He doesn't grab people off the street who look promising and send them out without any training. No, first, he calls them to himself. He called the twelve and began to send them out. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but there's something going on here and it's not really as efficient as it could be. Because wouldn't the sermons be better? Wouldn't you rather hear Jesus preach than me? No, of course we would. Of course we would. Of course I would. I wouldn't go across the street to hear me preach. But wouldn't all of these sermons be better if they were preached by Jesus? Wouldn't they be? Because he's preaching in verse 6. You see, the answer to that objection... It's the whole reason the passage exists. Jesus replicates himself by sending his disciples. That is the point of what he's doing. Because wouldn't the sermons have been better if Jesus preached them? Absolutely. But instead, he chooses and desires to use his followers to spread his gospel. Welcome to Christianity. In which that it's n- it's not that he needed professionals because if you want a job done right, what do you do? You do it yourself. Unless it's, you're me, then I, I get somebody else to do it because they do it themselves better than I do it myself. You know? <laughs> but the point is, is that Jesus is replicating himself. He was the teacher. Now all of them, they are the teachers because it's how Jesus set this whole thing up is to not be done by him. But to replicate him in the life of his followers. 
Couldn't Jesus do your job better than you? Absolutely he could. Couldn't Jesus be a better Christian and share the gospel better than you? Absolutely he could. But that's not what Christianity is about. You see how this whole thing is sent is that set up is that you are called to be sent. Because what Jesus does with a dirty, rotten, nasty scoundrel of a sinner like you is he calls you to himself and then he sends you out with that gospel. As Charles Spurgeon said, there are all kinds of men that can preach the gospel better than me. But you can't preach a better gospel. You can't preach a better gospel than the one that I preach. You can't share a better gospel than the one that you share. And it's his design and desire for you that you would both be called to him and sent out from him. And that's what he does with these men at the beginning, at the end of the book of Matthew, he sends out all of us. This is like the, the preview to the movie of how the church is built and spread. The previews have these 12 guys going out to do the job that you are now given. So let's look at how they do it. Well, how are they sent? How are they sent? Like animals going up on the ark, two by two, two by two. So we see that Jesus sends out these gentlemen in Christian community. Now, not only did Jesus not want him to be the primary speaker at all their events and all the houses and all the places, he sends his disciples. He didn't want them to be alone in doing what they're doing. He doesn't even send them alone. Well, this is what discourages Rambo Christianity, right? So there, there's all kinds of people and things in the church in which that some of us um, are desire to be spectators. There's, there's a desire to be a spectator in the church. And then there's another desire to be Rambo in the church. And, and what does a Rambo Christian look like? Does anybody know? Well, the Rambo Christian goes in and does everything himself. He does it all himself. He fights the whole army. One man, I mean, he's, he's bloody and got scars and his shirt's off. And he's taking them all on by himself. And there is not any help for him. Well, this spectator thing is evil. Right? Nobody's a spectator. And you know what else is evil? Rambo. Rambo. This is death to Rambo Christianity. Because when Jesus sends out his disciples, he does so not by themselves. Nothing you do should be done alone. You should have people with you, support, supporting you in what you do. Shouldn't be a spectator and you shouldn't be a one man show or one woman show. You shouldn't. He set this up like this. Now, if you're married, this, you, you, ha you can find a natural number two in the other half of your one flesh union. If you're not married, you need to be strategic about finding someone to come alongside you in service. That doesn't mean you don't need it. No. No. You still need it. You still need support and community in the mission that Jesus calls you on. No matter if you're married, single, or what life situation you find yourself in. So, he sends them out two by two, and in what other way does he send them? He sends them out with authority of his. Matthew 28 sets this up a little bit differently in which Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. 
Go therefore and preach the gospel, make disciples, and so on. But because of the authority, we now go. Now, the, the authority that they've been given is a little different than the authority that you've been given. Because as agents of revelation, here's what I mean by that. That these gentlemen were people who were the pillars of which the church was built on. Your name is Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church. Uh, here, here's the thing. They could do things that you can't do. And that's okay. They can do things that I can't do. And that's okay. Because to be an apostle like they were an apostle, Acts chapter 2 says that they had to partake in the physical, visual, body, bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So there are various denominations in our day and sects in Christianity in which they believe that apostles still exist. But here's the problem. Not one of those apostles in our modern day, not one of their birth certificates could ever be produced with 2,000 years on it. And because the people who were given this role are already dead, the office is closed and they never had a successor. Not in the early church, not in our day. However, we need to realize as we look at this text that we were sent out in community with authority in the middle of spiritual warfare. That's what we see in the second half of verse 12. Spiritual warfare is going on and we are sent out into it. The passage that I read in Luke says that we are sent out among amongst wolves, right? There is some evil things. You're going out into a mess. You're not invited to a birthday party. You're invited to a war. And there are unclean spirits in this war. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So companionship, spiritual authority in our everyday life. So Jesus replicates himself as he sends you and he does so as you are called to be sent. And not only that, but you're called to be dependent. And if you're one of the spectator Christians, you're like, oh, that sent thing is aggravating. If you're one of the Rambo Christians, this dependent thing is going to seem impossible for you. Because we see beginning in verse 8, he charges them what to take with them on this trip. So Jesus is saying, go, don't go by yourself, go together, go with authority against unclean spirits. So they're like, oh, they're, they're going to be, wait, they're, they're going to be demons on this trip? <laughs> oh yeah, they're going to be demons. There's going to be some demons. <laughs> okay, so what about a sword? <laughs> Machete? Maybe. <laughs> no. No, just take a staff, take some sandals, no spare clothes. But what if no spare clothes and no money? No money. No money. Okay. This is, is difficult. This is difficult. So where are we going to where are we going to stay? Where are we going to live? Well, if somebody lets you into their house, go in, go on. If they let you stay with them, stay there, stay where they let you. Okay, okay, all right. So really, there's no plan. But like, that's the plan is that there's not a plan. You, you see. You see the principle here, right? Later on, he's going to let them take stuff with them. Take that sword. 
I got one, two, that's enough. <laughs> you go. But they had to learn this first. They had to learn this. That they were to travel lightly and be dependent on, ultimately, the sovereignty of God. Who's going to take care of me on this trip? I don't have anything of my own to take care of myself on this trip. Do you not know that not a bird falls to the ground without the will of my Father? Do you not know? You don't think He's coordinating this thing? You know? They had, to, they had to learn this, to travel lightly. And you know what? It wasn't because they didn't have stuff. It wasn't because they were poor to start with. Because we could think that. We're like, well, Jesus was a homeless hippie and everybody that followed him was too. No, James and John had servants when they were called. How many servants do you have at your house? Well, they had servants. So the point was not, and they had a thriving business in a, in a place that expedited and sent out fish that were only there in Galilee. They had some means. The issue is, wasn't whether or not they had means. He's like, you, you don't have anything? Well, go out with the nothing you have, you know? No, it wasn't that. It's just that he did not want them to depend on the things that they did have. Don't, don't depend on what you have. Travel lightly on this journey. So here's, here's the point that we can glean from this, that, that we're called to be dependent, and we need to travel lightly and not be attached to the things that we have in this world. The issue isn't whether or not you have things or not. The issue is, do you depend on the things you have? Are they what you trust in instead of the sovereignty of God? That's the question that we have to answer I don't know about you, but this here's how we try to not do this with every fiber of our being. We accumulate for ourselves resources and a network of people with resources in order to insulate ourselves from ever needing anything in this world. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to be brought low. And we live our lives in our country in a way to never, ever experience that. We never want to experience need. We never want to go without. And we work our fingers to the bone to never, ever need anything. problem is that's ungodly that's ungodly to be totally self-sufficient in this world is ungodly and evil it is it is well god is so good and so sovereign that he will teach us this lesson that he told the way they told them to travel. Here's how this works. I've seen it. I've been there a million times. God will give us a need that no money can pay for. He will give us needs. Needs will arise to which you are completely powerless in front of them. Because you haven't been traveling lightly through this world. You haven't been like aliens and exiles like we're talking about in Hebrews and elsewhere of whom the world was not worthy. No, no, we're fine here. We're fine. We're all good. You know, we, we're not traveling lightly. If any of us move from our house, get ready for spring cleaning. It's awful. We have a lot of things, got a lot of junk 
and we don't want to move our junk. Sometimes we get garages to put our junk in. Sometimes we get storage units to put our junk in. We just got junk all over the place. And, and, and we're stressed about coordinating our junk. <laughs> about all these things. Well, well, why do we have all of this stuff? Well, because we're isolating ourselves from ever being in need or dependent on anyone else ever. That's why we got to play Tetris with our storage places. So when the blocks come in, we twist them, twist them, spin them, and fit it in. We do. That's what we do. But the problem is, is that Jesus did not want his followers to be dependent upon themselves. So when he sends these guys out, the first lesson that they had to learn is that they had to be dependent on God to supply their needs through the hospitality of others. That is how he called these gentlemen and sent them out on their very first mission trip. They had to be dependent. We have to learn this too. We, we have to learn this. A lot of times we learn this through sickness. Through sickness. And in which that there's no real answer, there's no real plain way to do it, that we are in need of the moving of the invisible sovereign hand of God. If you've had, had sickness for any amount of time, you know that this is it. It's Him. Like it's either Him or nobody for me. You realize that that's how you ought to live in every other arena? It's, it's either Him coming through or it's not happening. You know, Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. When's the last time that you ever had to pray for God to give you a meal? You pray for a meal that you already got. But no, that's not the, the attitude that we see here in Mark chapter 6. He's sending them out with not a thing. The better and quicker we learn to be dependent on the Lord in His mission, the better it will be. It's not wrong that they had things. He was just like, for this one, you're just going to set these things aside and, and trust the Lord. And go. Go. Wherever they, take you, wherever they let you in, you go ahead and you go. So, on one hand, they were to travel lightly. And depend only on God in prayer. That's what they were to do. Now, on the other side of the coin that we look at here, there were other people whom, in God's sovereignty, God made provide for the needs of others. So on one hand, there's these disciples sent out with nothing, and then on the other hand, there are these people who God called to provide for His people. Why isn't that how the church was set up in the book of Acts? This was the preview for that. So His design is that we would be dependent on Him. Not only that, but that we would provide for each other's needs. It's strange nowadays. Like I... I was driving a few years ago before marriage, before kids. I picked up a hitchhiker. How weird is, would that be nowadays? You know what I mean? Like how weird would that that be? I swerved a little bit to make him uneasy in case he's just thinking about trying something on me, you know? <laughs> he didn't know who he was dealing with. That's true. But how weird would it be to now go and like, hey, um, yeah, I'm uh, here to share the gospel and I'm going to need your spare room. And by the way, I'm doing keto right now, so I prefer almond milk as opposed to 2%. <laughs> how strange would, would that be in, in, our, in our modern culture? But you see, it's not necessarily the exact th same thing that, that has to happen. But the principle of hospitality should be in the church. Should be in the church. 
So as weird as that would be to go from church to church, that shouldn't be weird within the church to take care of the needs of each other like this. You need somewhere to stay? Okay. I've got a couch. You can't lay on it. You have to sit. It's one of those where the legs come up. So you, if you can sleep sitting up, you know. But is, is that attitude in the church? On one hand, these people are sent out de- dependently. And there's the people that ought to receive them and take care of them. That's what he begins in verse 10. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they are to go like this and they are to be received with this hospitality. Do you know this thing has been built like this from the beginning? It is not a new or novel idea that the church ought to be hospitable to one another. The Didache is a document that was supposedly developed from the teaching of the apostles. So they got this document, they wrote it together, and it says that if an apostle comes to you, that you ought to welcome them as you welcome the Lord himself. That was one of the foundational uh, documents of the church outside of the scriptures. They said that is how that ought to happen. I'll paraphrase it for you. Uh, It says he should not stay for more than a day unless there's a need in which he must stay longer. It says if he asks for money or he stays a long time, he's a false prophet. He's a false prophet. The point being, from the very beginning, they understood that they ought to be providing like this. Now, if if he stays all day in his pajamas on your couch and plays video games and eats Cheetos and doesn't share the gospel, he's a false prophet. Or if he wants you to sow this seed into his ministry so that he's a false prophet. But if he has needs, meet the needs. Like you're meeting the needs of the Lord. That is what we are to do. Because we're called to be sent, called to be dependent. And ultimately, here's our goal as we look at the text, is that we are called to make him known, to make Jesus known. We know back there in verse 10 that two things are going to happen. You're going to either be accepted or rejected. That's going to happen. But you still should go. So don't take anything with you. (laughs) Go where I send you. Don't take anything with you. And if they receive you, great. If they don't, shake off the dust and get on down the road. There's this that we're called to do as we spread the gospel. Now, in the middle of this text, if we're keeping all of this in context, what just happened in the first six verses of Mark chapter 6? Where did Jesus go? Home. Jesus went home. And why did he go home again? You can't go home again, they say. In fact, the last time Jesus went home, they tried to throw him over a cliff. So why did he go a second time? Well, the only difference between the first trip to Nazareth and the second trip to Nazareth is who was watching. Who's watching in the second trip? These guys. These guys. And Jesus went with his disciples to Nazareth. In his sovereign, wonderful mind, Jesus was like, I'm going to send these guys out. What does he show them? Rejection. He shows them rejection. That's what he does. Gets the guys, goes to Nazareth. They're offended at him. Get out of here. 
So this passage that we're looking at here today in verses 6 through the beginning of 14 is smack dab in the middle of Jesus' rejection in the first six verses and John the Baptist getting his head cut off. I'm going to send you guys out. They may receive you or they may cut your head off. You never know. But you need to be prepared for both. You need to be prepared for both. So he's calling them to make him known. In verse 12, so they went out, proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. as he's getting ready to transition there in verse 14, to the beheading of John the Baptist, we see that these men went out and were their own names known. No. No. Their own names weren't known. The name of Jesus was known because they went out. So when we're looking at this, we need to apply it at home, where we are. Now, some of us are being called, like Paul and Barnabas, in the meeting, the Spirit of God in the book of Acts, sent Paul and Barnabas out as missionaries. As we are here today, if the Holy Spirit is setting you apart to be sent out in this way, come get me over to the side at the end. We need to talk about this. If the Holy Spirit is sending you out like this, But you don't have to go home, but you you can't really stay here. (laughs) Meaning that none of us live in this building. We will go out somewhere from here. So in that, we have to be obedient to these principles where we go, where we live, and what we do. None of us are hermits who live in the, in the hills and, and we don't see anyone at any time ever. That's not how it works for us. There are people that we come into contact with. There is a field in which that we operate. And if you look at verse 12, you see what they did. And now, Mark, before we look at verse 12, Mark, what he does is he, he's shorthand. This is fast. Immediately, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. Resurrection, gone. Boom. So here's a shorthand. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. Is that all that they said? Repent, repent, repent. No, that's just shorthand for the gospel that Jesus preached in the beginning. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So the focus is the gospel of repentance. That's what they preached, according to verse 12. So you're going and you're being sent, called to Jesus, sent from Jesus at some point in time and some way in some conversation as this, as you go out, there has to be a moment in which that you talk to someone else about how they are going to come in contact with a holy God and that they should turn around from their sin and not meet him in their sin. This is what it looks like at home for us. This is what some of us are meant to go to peoples who have never heard. And they should turn around before they come into contact with a holy God. But all of us are called to Jesus, sent from Jesus with the message that God is going to judge sins, turn from those things and trust in the Lord Jesus. That is that needs to be a component that's regularly talked about with conversations that we have with people. Because otherwise, how would they know? How would they know what it's going to be like when they come in contact with a holy God? You know, our our little boy had a, a nightmare last week after he watched the movie Frozen. And if you're a parent or a grandparent, it's already your nightmare. 
The movie Frozen is already your nightmare. Can we just sing it all together? I'm just kidding. No, no, no. Please, no. Let it go. Let it go. And in the movie Frozen, by the way, <laughs> uh, there is a snowman. And his name is, anybody know? Olaf. And Olaf is there with Kristoff. And he says, I don't know why, but I, I just, he's a snowman, by the way. I just can't get over the idea of summer. I can't get over the idea of summer. I have loved the idea of summer, sun, all things hot. And then he begins to, begins to sing about he, how he can't wait to do what happens to snowmen in summer. I can't wait to do this. To which Kristoff says, I take it that you don't have an experience with heat. You don't have much experience with heat, do you? To which he said, no, oh, no. And here's what he says. He says, somebody's got to tell him. Somebody's got to tell him. Somebody's got to tell him what happens to snowmen in the summer. Meanwhile, there's people all around us. When I meet God, I'm going to straighten some things out with him. I'm going to tell him some stuff when I see him. Or, or when I meet God, I can't wait to get my wings or other cultural blah that people have. Right? I just can't wait for that to happen. Or I, when I rest in peace, not everybody rests in peace. It's not graduation from 11th to 12th grade. So all, all these people saying, I can't wait, or that's going to happen. When the truth is that it's better to be a snowman in summer than meet a holy God in your sin. Because when sinners come into contact with a holy God... It's worse than a snowman in summer. There's wrath and fury and anger upon sin. Like Israel upon the mountain, there's thick darkness and fear in the presence of a holy God. Hence, why chapter or verse 12, our message to them is to turn around from the direction they're going because you don't want to find out what it's going to be like in that summer. They can't wait. They're excited. They have all these misconceptions about meeting God and what the end of their life is going to be like. Hence, when Jesus calls people to Himself and He sends them out, He does so with the message of repent. Turn from that death that you are headed to because when you come in contact with God, it will not be a good day in your sin. You see, verse 12 is what's at stake for all of us in whether or not we're obedient to this commission. There's all these people headed Right? That repenting means to turn. There's all these people headed to what happens to a snowman in summer. Except they won't melt. They'll just keep burning. Hence, why when Jesus calls these men to Himself, He calls you to Himself, He sends you out. And the message is, to repent. To turn from your sin. That's what he does. Verse 13 says that they, Jesus' ministry was replicated in their life. Cast out demons and healed. And that's what they did. 
As a result, verse 14, their own names weren't known, but Jesus' name was known. You see, Jesus does this because he has a plan and a desire and a will to be known in the sending of his people. You realize that, that Jesus wants to be known in the way that you are sent so that people will repent of their sin. So if you're not a Christian today, you don't want to find out what happens to a snowman in summer or a sinner in the hands of an angry God. While there is grace, turn from your sin. And if you're a Christian looking at this passage, these are the basics. This is, this is where we start, knowing that we're called to Jesus, sent from Jesus. Absolutely. Absolutely we are. We're sent to depend on Him and to make Him known. So what are you going to do? In what way are you going to re- depend on Him in order to make Him known? What are you going to ask Him to do in your life so that sinners may repent and the Savior is known? What are you going to do? Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Scriptures. Help us repent of being spectators in Your body being Rambos in your body, trying to do everything ourselves. We just want to be faithful in your body. So we ask that you would soften our hearts. Your word says that you move the hearts of kings like water in your hand. We pray that you would move our hearts to not only be sent, but to depend on you in ways that make you known to others. Please do this for us. Save those among us and save those because you've sent us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.